Shukran, Lieutenant Colonel Ali. Salam alaikum, sabah Good morning. Um, I'd like to start by just explaining why you have a marine biologist standing here addressing an austere body of dynamic firefighters. My, my background is, uh, is actually marine biology oceanography, but I spent uh, 30 years in the oil industry, um, initially with BP, and was involved in emergency response planning and oil spill response. So I've, I've a, a, a fair amount of experience on, on the emergency response side, which has grown into crisis management response. Um, I was invited about a year ago by the uh, Major General to come and join um, a team from the department to look at the Fujira Industrial Oil in Industry Zone. Um, it was quite visionary, I believe, from the Major General, and then he wanted somebody who was not a firefighter, but somebody who understood how the oil industry works. And one of the key areas of development in the industry, unfortunately, since a series of major um, accident in, uh, and incidents over the years, is the concept of, of developing a system whereby you can try to eliminate and manage the potential hazard from what is a pretty hazardous industry. So I'm not going to talk to you about firefighting, but I am going to follow up on, on, on the invitation um, from nearly a year ago to come and look at uh, how the industry goes about trying to control major accident hazards. And then I'll touch very briefly on incident preparedness. So thank you, sir, and thank you for inviting me back again. It's, it's a privilege to be here. I'll set the scene, um, and I'll go, as, as Tony did, we'll look at some and a major incident hazard, which was the Bunsfield accident. I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. And then I'll look at the three main pillars that we use in the oil and gas industry to, to look at how we might control these hazards. Um, I want to introduce the concept of health, safety, environment, culture, corporate culture. This is something I've been doing a lot over the last five or six years, working with senior managers, um, executives and main board directors of independent and major corporations and understanding what makes the corporation tick when it comes to health, safety and environment. I'll touch very briefly on hazard and risk um, assessment and review. I know this is something that, that as firefighters on scene you do constantly and continuously as, as an incident evolves. I want to take us back because the whole point of my discussion is to try and open your eyes to the work that needs to go on to prevent the need to call firefighters to a scene. And I'll talk about something which has gained a lot of interest in the industry recently and that's process safety management asset integrity. And then as I said I'll wrap up at the end without wishing to insult your intelligence but, but we have to recognise at the end of the day, no matter how well we do our planning, there is always, always a risk that incidents will occur um, and that we have to be prepared and ready to respond. Okay, so Bunsfield, December 2005, petroleum storage facility in a fairly densely populated area in the UK. They were filling tanks with petroleum the high alarms failed because they hadn't been maintained and serviced. People knew that the systems hadn't been maintained and serviced. The tanks overflowed into a bund. The bund then overflowed and went into waterways. And when they switched on the pump systems, the vapor cloud that had developed resulted in this major incident. And that was the aftermath. Five days, the fire services, and I can't remember how many fire crews were involved, but it was an amazing event. Um, closed Heathrow Airport for a while and affected and caused uh, major atmospheric pollution, but created some massive groundwater pollution as a result of the volumes of fire water that were put onto the hydrocarbons. So what I have here 
is a little clip, I hope, taken from the BBC News at the time. So I'm, I just want to set the scene because I want you then to bear in mind, as I said, the, the request from the Major General for me to come and look at how the Fujiria oil uh, zone is being developed. Bunsfield is about a quarter of the size, or was, it, was a quarter of the size, of the development which is, which is going ahead in Fujiria. <laughs> Good afternoon, this is BBC News 24. I'm Chris Eakin near Hamel Hempstead in Hertfordshire, where there were a series of huge explosions this morning which could be heard as far away as Holland. They're headlines this afternoon. Pictures taken from just after these explosions happened showed just how dramatic the scene was here with shockwaves being sent up to 100 miles away. Firefighters have been starting from the outside and working towards the inside, but they have made it clear that it's a question of containing this fire rather than putting it out. And as the cloud heads up and then east across much of the southern part of the country, there is a health warning. If you're in its path, stay indoors, keep your windows and doors shut. There's been a huge knock-on effect for traffic. The M1 motorway is closed. Even flights at Heathrow have been affected. Well, hello. We're a mile or so away from the seat of this fire, from where the explosions happened at 6 o'clock in the morning. And despite it was so long ago, Still, the smoke coming out at the same sort of rate, up into the sky and then moving off towards the east, affecting large parts of the south of England, of the southeast in particular. Okay, um, what I want to just do is reflect on, I, I'm not going to go into depth of, of causes and what have you, because I, I repeat, I am trying to get back to the management structures and what we need to put in place before something like this happens. So how we are going to deal with, uh, with our major accident hazards. Bunsfield, the summary, operators management systems were inadequate in several respects. There was a culture where keeping the process operating was the primary focus. And process safety did not get the attention, resources or priority it required. The drive was to keep the operating operations going rather than following a set system. Systems are developed to control and they are put in place in what I call 2020 hindsight in a cool, calm period. As soon as you step outside of that systematic approach, things start to go wrong. Tony gave us a classic illustration this morning of people failing to do a proper inspection of of, of, of the railway system. The Herald of Free Enterprise um, was a fundamental failure of a, of a system where there was not a second double check on the bow doors of the vessel. Um, it should have been in place, it didn't happen. Some of it is human error, which, which we will never eliminate. Most of it is the fact that because humans don't follow the system they're supposed to follow. Another example, Space Shuttle Columbia, if you remember back. And this was the, the, um, uh, the review after the fact. The organizational causes of this accident are rooted in the Space Shuttle's program's history and culture. Cultural traits and organizational practices detrimental to safety were allowed to develop. I could go on. One more example, Texas refinery. It was seen as a process failure, a cultural failure, and a management failure. And I could provide you with more examples uh, from the oil and gas industry. Unfortunately, BP, again, at the Macondo incident in, in um, the Gulf of Mexico, major oil spill. Um, people forget that 11 people died in the incident. But again, system failures. People did not follow 
their risk assessments and they did not follow their management systems. So I want to just talk about culture. What do I mean by culture? I'll, I'll give you very simple examples to get your mindset. I'm English. We heard from the fire chief in Paris, he's French. We have a wonderful cultural difference between the English and the French. I'm English from the West, you're from the Middle East, I spend a lot of time in the Far East. Three very different cultures. What I'm talking about here is the culture for safety management, for health and safety in order to prevent incidents. Very simple way of describing it in the oil industry is, hey, this is how we do it around here. This is what we mean by our health, safety and environmental commitment. You go on to the web pages of any of the major and smaller oil companies, you will find vision statements, value statements, and you will find culture statements. This is how we manage health, safety and environment. Simple, a definition, the product of individual and group values and attitudes, perceptions, our thought processes, competencies, our training, our education, and patterns of behavior. If somebody can't maintain or inspect a system because he doesn't have enough time, the value now in the oil industry is stop. We stop work. We don't continue. I have to do this job. This is part of my competency. This is part of my pattern of behavior. So it's providing this authority to be able to say, well, we have to step outside, stop, and carry on with work. Not pressure to produce for money, for profit, for, for, for keeping production up, for keeping petrol moving through a plant. We have to understand that the whole attitude um, and, and culture of organizations has shifted. It's a paradigm shift. So the style proficiency of an organization's health and safety, safety management system. That is what I mean by HSE culture. So I hope that is a simple explanation of where I'm going next. In the oil and gas industry, we've moved our technology and standards. In the early days, we designed everything. We built, we designed engineering-wise two and a half, three times over the safety case. So we tend to engineer our systems. We've introduced incredible technology and, and we've written standards. This went a long way in reducing the incident rates in the early days, and by that I mean the 70s and 80s in the oil industry. We then developed our management systems, our control systems. We put the standards in place, we trained people, and we developed our management systems. We, we, we started to bottom out a little bit from that, which is where the concept of culture came into the business. It's the way we think about how we do things. And, and if I could just say about uh, the Fujira Industrial um, Zone, we have a dozen companies, different operators, all operating in the same area. And there is a need to put this HSE culture over the top of this, to introduce the systems of controls, the planning controls, such that we can control the whole area as a major hazard uh, risk area. So, so putting culture on top of our systems and our engineering capabilities is what is taking us up to the next level. So implementing a management system is one thing, and we can do that, we can demonstrate it's done, we bring people like me in to do audits and tick boxes, um, but we actually have to complement that with, with the right culture. Um, these next slides, it, it, it was a concept that's been developed, it was initially developed by Shell. They're trying to get the cultural levels up, and it's a, it's a program called Hearts and Mind. This has now been taken on by the international oil industry, by the energy industry, um, and we come up with what we call a table, a culture ladder. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner of that ladder, it says pathological. What do we care about? health, safety, and environment in this organization. All we're interested in is not going to jail, not getting fined. All we really want is profit, and we don't care. We, we can move our way up this ladder, and, and, and that's the objective. I won't dwell on each level, but you can see the concept. We're moving from 
not caring too much. We're increasing um, our capability, our competence. We're increasing trust and we're increasing accountability as we move up the ladder. We move through reactive. Every time we have an incident, we do something about it. Well, frankly, if you have an incident, it's too late. The whole idea is to stop the incident occurring. We move up to calculative. We can say, well, we've got the systems in place, we've got an HSE manager, and we've got six safety officers. We're still not getting the culture. The safety officer's job is actually to maintain and watch and make sure the system's working. We've got to move the trust and the accountability to every single person in the organisation, from the chief executive, from the major general, right the way down through the organisation to the man in the, who produces the coffee in the control room. These people are all important and part of the system. The aim is to get to the top right-hand corner, which is what we call a generative, highly reliable organisation. What we're looking for is we, we need to know that everybody knows what they're doing, that they've been properly trained, and that they know how to do their job. More important, we know that managers are actually there on the spot and they're actually taking part they're not sitting in their offices twiddling their thumbs, they're out and about and they're making sure that the areas that they are responsible for and they demonstrate genuine leadership. Decisions are taken by those who are competent to make the decisions. Simple as that. People are enabled, they can make changes swiftly. So if you see something that's not right, you are encouraged to stand back and say, well, stop, let's get this right before we move to the next stage. People report mistakes. If they make errors, they report their own errors. And we have this concept of a near miss. Standing there, something drops from the ceiling, hits the ground, and you think, oh, that's lucky. If I'd been stood there, that would have hit me. Now, that is a near miss. There is no incident, but there could have been. So getting people's culture and thought process to start looking for, oh, what if this had happened? What if that had happened? We want to look and make sure that people are mindful of risks and hazards. We're always looking for the hazards. The whole intent is to understand the hazard, understand the causes, and then eliminate that as an issue. People recognize there's a clear line between acceptable and unacceptable. Somebody sneaking off to have a crafty cigarette around the back of a tank farm, absolutely we know that's unacceptable. So people recognize that their behaviors are actually influenced by other people and can influence other people. So that's where I'm coming from in terms of culture. Um, I wanted then to talk a little bit about hazard and risk. As I said, you guys are very familiar with assessing hazard and ha assessing risk. When you respond, you first thing you do, uh, Klaus, you, you mentioned that this morning, you stand back and you look at see what's going on, you put your teams into place, and then you continually assess the risk, because it changes. I'm talking here about before we even start a project. So at Fujera, for example, we've got, we've got a major crude oil terminal, we've got major national uh, white product terminal. So two of your major national strategic hydrocarbon industry companies are based in Fujera. So we need to look at what the hazards are, not just the hazards in one operation, we've got to look at the hazards that occur outside that. How can this affect my operation? How can my operation affect the next operation? So we're looking, first of all, to look at the hazards. So what is the hazard? Bunsfield, overfilling of a tank. That is the hazard. So we look at the hazard. We then need to know, well, what would cause that hazard to occur? So in this case, we had high-level alarms. They didn't work. So the cause of the overspill was the fact that a high-level alarm failed. So the hazard, which is petroleum getting into a bund, has been affected by the cause, which is the fact that the high-level alarms didn't shut down the system. So we're taking a hazard, we're looking at the effect, and then we want to start looking at the systematic and then root causes of risk. We have to keep moving, so I'm, I'm not going to bore you with this thing, but all I'm showing you here is a process. This is the risk management process. Identify the hazards, look at the consequences, look at the probability, the consequence and the probability provides the risk. How often is it going to happen? What can we put in place to control the hazard, 
the trigger mechanism, reduce the frequency or to reduce the effect, the consequence. We're looking at risk management. Very simply, we can look at consequences in a series of ways. I'm just going to show you a very simple five by five matrix. We can look at our, our risk categories, our consequent categories from insignificant to catastrophic. We can then look at it in different ways. We can look at it how it may harm people. Because again, in, in the oil industry, we have a very simple goal, no harm to people. That is the primary aim. Nobody gets hurt. Everybody goes home. Everybody goes home with all their fingers. So we can look at harm to people. We can look at simple financial loss. The numbers in here, for example, we're talking about 10 to 50 million. I've just been working with a series of oil companies who are drilling deep water wells um, offshore Africa. It costs one and a half million dollars a day for the rig. So if you have 10 days of downtime on the rig because somebody's forgotten a critical piece of equipment or a spare part, you're immediately into 15 million dollars. 10, 10 days downtime, that, that's, that's not really quite catastrophic, but we're talking of numbers like 50 millions. Environmental damage. We can talk about oil spills, we can talk about the effect on the environment. That's, that's, another, that's another talk I'll come back and happily do for you. Um, we talked about reputation. Tony mentioned it this morning. Townsend, Torres and car ferries don't exist anymore. Um, the operator of the Piper Alpha platform in the North Sea was thrown out of the country for being an unsafe operator. So we, reputational risk is very important. For the Emirates, there is a reputational risk. There is a lot strategically at stake in Fujairah. There is a lot at stake in the country. You, we, we're in the middle of the most amazing Grand Prix racing track I've ever seen. You have Disney World, you have everything, all sorts of things here. Imagine a Bunsfield in the Emirates. What message is that gonna send you know, internationally? So, that's reputation. We can look at the probability. What is the probability of a Bunsfield occurring? What is the probability of a Piper Alpha, of a railway crash? We, we, can, we can put a number on it. Something that happens every year, something that happens every 10 years. Uh, I'm an oceanographer. I was involved in design of, of uh, offshore structures. We used to have what we call the 100-year wave. The 100-year wave at Magnus in the North Sea was exceeded three times in the first year of operation. Shows how good we were at calculating probability. We combine the two, the consequence and the probability, and we can come up with simple risk matrix. We can come up at the top there of what we call risk tolerance. Something in the black zone, we say this is non operable. We cannot work here. We have to do something. We have to put controls in place that reduce the hazard, reduce the risk. So we're trying to move through red to yellow to green, something that is acceptable. Some hazards, we're dealing with explosive, volatile uh, materials in the oil industry. We can't remove all the risks, but we can put controls in place where we can try and uh, mitigate um, and, and minimize the risk. So we're trying to move from black, intolerable, unacceptable towards something that is acceptable. And, and this is the planning phase. This is the key thing. We're back to what I've been lecturing about. We're talking about how to prevent major hazards from manifesting themselves. If we understand the hazards, if we understand the risks, we can put the controls in place to try to mitigate. At the core of managing a major hazard business should be clear, positive process safety, leadership from the board level downwards, and competence to ensure that these hazards and these risks are being managed. So process safety management is, is, is one of the key tools that we're now using in the oil and gas industry. And it takes us through a series of things. It takes us through a prevention and control of events that have the potential to lead to a materials and energy release. We're talking about engineering, we're talking about systems, procedures, people, training, attitude, culture, behavior. All of these things pulled together 
lead us into this concept of process safety management. We're looking for a disciplined framework for managing the integrity of operating systems. We can't afford inspectors to miss an inspection. We can't afford for equipment not to go through preventative maintenance. We have to make sure that the systems are robust and the operating procedures that go with those systems are robust. We have to do this through applying good design, good engineering, and good operating, good maintenance procedures. And good training, because it comes back to people. At the end of the day, it comes back to the competency of the people who are running these systems. We have another concept that's also been introduced more recently into the industry, and that is asset integrity. If you think of a, a rig, an oil rig, an offshore platform, an onshore platform, a, a tank facility, this is an asset, and we need to make sure that the integrity of this asset is maintained. So we want to make sure that the outcome of good design, good engineering, good construction, which brings in all sorts of other ideas, such as contractor controls, um, engineering controls and contractor controls. And then we take that through to engineering and operating practice. So we're, we're bringing all of these ideas together and they are all targeted and aimed at making sure that major hazards don't get released. I just then wanted to talk about something that I, I think you're probably much more comfortable with is, is talking about how we respond and how we prepared um, uh, and, and come up with integrated planning for incident response. I'm, I'm very just very simply going to throw at you the ISO standard 22399. Um, guidelines for incident preparedness and operational continuity management. This is becoming the basic standard for preparing for our emergency responses. It takes an organization and it looks at potential incidents and potential disruptions and it puts us in a position where we can avoid the suspension of critical operations and services. So in the middle of an incident, things start to collapse. What we're trying to do is shift from, from chaos, which is what you're faced right at the beginning, move things into a planned phase. I, I was involved a long time ago in 1989 with the Exxon Valdez oil spill. For those of you who are A, old enough to remember it or have a, have a recollection that far back. What astounded me was Exxon moved into, in, into Alaska an army, far too many. 10,000 people were mobilized into the area. They polished every rock. They caused more environmental damage polishing rocks than, than, than the oil would ever have done. But it was a war zone. It was incredible, the logistics they put in place. They had a very simple concept in mind. They wanted to move from chaos um, to a planned event. They called it a project. So they shifted, um, and, and, and the preparedness and the planning that went into moving that, that oil spill event was, was actually quite incredible. And we're talking 20, nearly 25 years ago. This new standard or, or is, is basically taking the concept of what I've been talking about, management systems, management of planning, and applying it to, to what you guys professionally do so outstandingly well. And that's making sure that when we approach uh, an incident, we are actually planned and prepared. We have to try and move an event which takes a long time to ramp up. So the time it takes to ramp up and get to 100% um, efficiency in responding to an emergency, by doing the proper planning and the proper continuity planning, we can shift this line and we can make sure that our response occurs much quicker. So preparedness, emergency response, continuity, continuity and recovery. Those are the targets. And the ISO standard is, is going to help prepare for that. What the standard actually provides us with is, is an understanding of the organization. What are we working in? What is the area we're working in? What are our constraints? And what are the threats? to us being able to make sure that we can continue to respond. We need to be able to quantify the impacts on critical operational functions. If a part of the function goes down, we have to have something to come in behind that and replace it. 
we're looking at functions processes to maintain criticality. We need to determine what the short and long term requirements are for success. We can't just look and be, be, be blinkered. We have to be holistic and look at it across the board. We need to identify the infrastructure and resources. That's not just equipment, that's people and their competencies. Um, and we need to make sure that we've got the resources to, to maintain a minimum level. We also need to be able to ramp up and bring in extra resources as needed. We need to document what the resources and the responsibilities. The responsibility this morning, Klaus, I think, illustrated perfectly well. Who's in charge? We don't need to get into a committee and start discussing who's going to be in charge. It's all predetermined, predefined. That means we can move in and, and, and make sure that our critical functions are, are, are working. We have to maintain the ability to recognize the risks and the hazards of changing. When you discover suddenly that you've got a whole series of gas containers, pressurized tanks, then you suddenly discover, oh, we've got radioactive material. The risks have changed. We're not just here to put a car fire out. So the ability to be able to think on your feet, keep things, well, think about it. We can do it beforehand. That's what I've been talking about. We're talking about preparedness for control in major accident hazards. Communicate. If we don't talk to people, everything fails. So I'll just wrap up by saying thank you, sir. It's been a privilege to come back again um, and, and, and work with the department. Um, it's, it's, it's a great honor for me to do that. So thank you, gentlemen, ladies. Thank you, Ian. Ian's just said to me, so sum that up. <laughs> well, I mean, where do you start? I mean, there's some very key, key stages coming through there. Obviously, culture. Um, and, and in the culture um, perspective, I think that that affects us all uh, because culture is a very wide-ranging issue. You know, and this kind of concept of, of, of changing the culture of how we, we approach management of incidents can be can be very much uh, applied across the board. You know, I think one of the aspects that came out for me, for me there, Ian, was that um, there's this culture of production, and it was one of the reasons for the Bunswick um, fire, that there was this focus on production. The culture was focused on production, not safety. Um, and, and, as, and as within the Emirates and within the region and w or across the world, as, as things speed up again after the financial crisis, you know, there will be this there will be this focus changing on kind of, right, well, let's get going again. Let's, let's, let's leave all of these, these lear lessons learned behind and let's keep just focusing on the goal, on this, on, you know, um, development, all of those kind of things. And it would be great if we could take stock uh, and, and introduce into this new um, uh, opportunity uh, this idea of, of, of this working culture and, and, and safety culture. Hazards and risk, and the second aspect of Ian's presentation, I thought it was really interesting that uh, you outlined uh, the, 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 the processes of that, uh, and in particular that you know, a hazard is something that happens, and it's the hazardous event uh, which is actually the interaction with the hazard that causes the problem in the first place, not actually the hazard itself, but obviously reducing the probability of that hazardous event happening or reducing the, co the, the, the consequence of that, hap that event happening actually reduces the, the risk and that is the process of risk management, reducing the consequence or the probability down to an acceptable level, which is the, which is the actual management of that, that risk itself. And again, this, this, this aspect of management, and I think that one of the key aspects of what, you, what came out from there, Ian, was this, this issue of control. Uh, it was the real kind of strong theme from that. I mean, we're talking about um, control of uh, and preparedness, asset integrity, control of the process, control of the functions, and also one of the things that really kind of leapt between uh, Herr Mara's uh, presentation, the first part this morning, was control of change as well, particularly through an incident. Because, you know, you, you're going to, as, you, as, as uh, 
as Klaus mentioned this morning, all of a sudden new information comes to light and then that changes and they're controlling that change. And I also picked up from your, your presentation and, and, and with yours Ian as well, you know, switching control, who's in control now and being prepared for that is a really important aspect of this theme of preparedness that we're seeing running through this whole conference. So thanks again Ian.